is primary school or secondary school? Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to some of you and welcome for the first time to others. Uh, my name is Annie Fletcher and I'm a curator here at the FNAPA Museum and one of many important uh, people around here who are, is busy with the, the development of this project, Becoming Dutch. Um, I'll explain a little bit about all the involvement of, of many, many authors and voices in this project um, as I explain the structure in a while. But first I would just like to welcome you to what we call the, the, the public programming of the Eindhoven Caucus. This is the second weekend where we've tried to open the museum um, and to try and think through many of the problems and questions that have emerged when we posed this this idea of what would it be to become Dutch or to be Dutch and how the museum might think about that particular idea. Um, the caucus is a part of a longer project. Becoming Dutch is a two-year uh, project that the museum has embarked on, partly because we felt it was extremely important not to think as an authoritative force to try and say, well, this is our idea about what the notion of living together, the understanding of collectivity, the understanding of a kind of developing or becoming identity might be. It seemed really important to take the temperature of the time to try and think through collectively with the people around us, um, the people who kind of are part of our constituency as a museum and in the broader sphere, how we might think together and decide on what are the urgent questions of our moment. And so to that end, we began the project Becoming Dutch in. January um, of this year with the gatherings, which was a moment uh, three of three days, um, which, uh, to which we invited many people who have come back, in fact, artists, thinkers, speakers. We wanted to think through the notion of our locatedness. What is it to be right here, right now in the Netherlands? What does it say um, in terms of uh, who we're addressing as a museum, both on a local, national and international level? How do we think about this idea of our locatedness versus an idea of globalization, or what Roger Bergel called last week, maybe more precisely, an integrated, uh, glo um, an, an integrated world capitalism. So these are kind of many of the questions that we've been kind of toying with and thinking about over the last while. And we have been working towards this caucus, this great coming together, this great thing, which is uh, four weeks of communally producing, questioning, and thinking and we're so happy that so many of you have agreed to come and join us. The way the project works is that we have this p uh, public weekend program, as I explained, um, but also we have f uh, 40 artists, thinkers, um, organizers who have agreed generously to give of their time to be with us for a period of three, uh, three and a half to four weeks to, um, to really um, attend everything, to talk with us, to kind of be a kind of critical mass, a building critical mass, um, and who can hopefully help us kind of put our own ideas under pressure. The end of this project will be an exhibition in May 2008, and it's our intention to try and think through certain rubrics that we've proposed right now, um, and to think with artists and to hear proposals and to, and to think about making work as a result of this conversation. And so when we talk today, we actively encourage uh, people uh, to, to question and to debate with us. This is really a collective discursive space. We hope it's that. So the questions that we sort of began with, um, I suppose, over the last year, and some of them have already been beautifully picked apart in the uh, last weekend's um, uh, discussions are uh, uh, three kind of paradoxes that we sort of proposed as a way in which we might uh, explore certain issues around the idea of becoming Dutch. Um, the first one is the idea of um, looking at the revival or the seeming re-emergence of nationalism versus the kind of um, yeah, realities of, of immigration and globalization. What can art say about this dichotomy? Is it a dichotomy? Is it a false paradox? Is this something we can explore together right now? Secondly, we want to look at the idea of the, 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 the kind of uh, emergence of religion as the dominant uh, cultural identifier right now. Um, and what that might be versus the kind of paradox of the secular globalization of capital. Is, there, is, is this, again, a kind of paradox? Are, are these interdependent? And how might we explore these notions? And as you look through the program for the next few weeks, many of the speakers have chosen some of these topics to kind of really think through rather precisely. And the third one, of course, um, 
is about our position also as a museum. What role can art play in sort of thinking through these questions? It's, uh, in fact, the very fundament of the, the caucus, the idea of this political term, caucus, which is a gathering together, often in contemporary times, of politicians who sort of decide on policy, who debate together, who work through ideas. And we propose that we can also make a caucus as critical thinkers and as artists. We can join together. And, uh, and propose certain ideas for our society. And perhaps art is a really exciting place to think through and propose new ideas. The third rubric then is about the notion of the autonomy of art versus its critical and social use. So these are things that we just hold in the back of our mind. We, again, are willing and happy to kind of argue about them and to pick them apart and to think whether they're, in fact, relevant questions or maybe new ideas will come out of this caucus. So. Um, Without further ado, I'd like to hand over and thank very much our, our speakers, our panelists today, and uh, the director, Charles Escher, will also act as a moderator. Um, and we'll have a panel discussion until one o'clock, a break for lunch, and then we begin with the keynote speak of uh, Homi Baba. Thank you. Um, thank you, Annie. Um, <laughs> even if you finished slightly earlier than I anticipated, thank you very much. Um, and welcome, everybody, to the second weekend as well. Um, my name is Charles Escher, and I'll be moderating this panel. Annie and I are um, swapping around duties, basically. Um, I think that today's uh, panel um, will look fundamentally at the construction and deconstructions of nationalism and how art can play, should play, might play a role uh, in understanding those constructions and deconstructions. Um, I think it's particularly interesting um, from the point of view of the Netherlands um, to understand questions of our relationship as a country to colonialism um, and the awkwardness of um, many European countries uh, relations to colonialism. And I say European countries including Israel for a moment because in many ways it is included in the European mindset. Um, it's uh, not only the dominant colonial powers that have a, um, a sense of uh, a colonial history or perhaps an amnesia towards a colonial history. And I think that's one thing that um, in looking at some of the case studies that we'll see um, to understand uh, the comparisons with our own history here. And I think one of the things about becoming Dutch is that it can't only exclusively focus on the specificities of this nation state, of this history, um, but also in order to understand this society and this condition better, we need constantly to see it through the mirrors of others, many, many others, not a single other, not only the United States, if you like, which is the main model that we have in order to think about our history, as Paul Schaeffer proved in his first talk, that the United States was the model that he wished to use in order to understand immigration in the Netherlands. Um, I think we need a plurality of models uh, in order to understand what might be happening here. Um, so uh, I think that that discussion, I hope, uh, we will have in the second part of this morning's session. Uh, in the first part of the morning session, I've asked each of the uh, panel members um, to make a short-ish presentation, not, <laughs> not too short, short, but not too long, um, around about 15 to 20 minutes, if that's okay, um, particularly looking at certain uh, work that they've been engaged in over the past few years, um, in some cases very specific projects um, that have thrown up uh, some of the questions that I think we want to ask in this project um, in their own situations, in their own conditions. Um, using their own histories. Um, the first person I'd like to ask, and I really have to look through my notes now. Where did it go? Sorry, Tom. Uh, is Tona O. Nielsen, who's based in Copenhagen in Denmark, um, and is an independent curator, an educator, and a founding member of the Artistic um, Curator Collective, 
Colin Nielsen with her husband, and also the curatorial collective, Curatorische Aktion, I think, Curatorial Action. Um, she's made uh, a number of projects also in the United States uh, and was for a time based in Los Angeles um, and came back to Copenhagen, I think, about five or six years ago um, and made uh, a major project, I think, which uh, stirred up a lot of um, reactions and questions in Denmark, another country with a colonial or non-colonial history, and that's what we're going to hear about, I think, uh, which was made in Aarhus, in the, the second city of, uh, um, of Denmark. Um, uh, in 2004, in 2004. Um, it was called um, Minority Report. Minority Report. Challenging intolerance in contemporary Denmark. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I could see why I couldn't remember it. Challenging yeah. intolerance <laughs> in contemporary Denmark. Um, Tona, thank you very much. Thanks. S um, as you could tell, my projects tend to have long titles, and I'm a bit scared that my talk is going to be too long, so I'll skip a few things. I'm really, really happy to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about the most recent project I've uh, produced, uh, Rethinking Nordic Colonialism, a post-colonial exhibition project in 5X. Uh, which I curated with Friederike Hansen uh, under the collective name Kortorisk Aktion. Uh, we were employed as curators by ADNIFCA, Nordic Institute for Contemporary Art in Helsinki, and uh, developed this project for them. The project didn't um, happen at NIFCA, but unfolded in Iceland, Greenland, the Faroe Islands, Finnish Sapmi and the Scandinavian capitals from March uh, 24th until November 25th last year. Um, as Charles said, uh, prior to that, uh, I had done a project trying to investigate notions of racism in Denmark. Why was racism increasing in Denmark? What were the historical, ideological, social, political, economical um, conditions for a rising intolerance? Um, and that project sort of left us with the answer that Paul Gilroy raised in that project, namely that until European countries come to an understanding or remembering of their colonial past, we will never be able to deal with the problematics of global migration. So picking up on this cue from Paul Gilroy, uh, Frederica and I proposed this particular project which looked at the specific history of colonialism as being conducted historically by the Scandinavian countries. But before I get further into the project as such, uh, I just want to tell you a little bit about uh, Kuratorisk Aktion's practice. What happened to my cursor? Um, Kuratorisk Aktion was founded in 2005 by myself and Friederike Hansen, who is also Danish-born but based in Berlin. And we as a collective engage in a critical praxis along the lines of race, class, gender and sexual orientation. And we do that by merging post-colonial, feminist, queer, activist, sustainable development and radical democracy theories. Kuratorisk Aktion stresses the social political dimension of curating. We believe that it has a potential to promote positive social change, um, thereby not saying that we can put Bush out of office, but we believe that our projects as a process of curatorial knowledge production uh, can become transformative uh, when our audiences and participants acquire new objects of knowledge coming out of the projects. We developed a quite uh, um, specific mission statement uh, which circles around three principles. First of all, all our exhibition projects uh, pledge themselves to a 65% representation of women and minority practitioners and a 35% representation of majority practitioners. We've developed this principle of what you could call affirmative action or positive discrimination in order to steer clear of stereotyping and tokenizing the other by way of underrepresentation, 
and to provide a platform where alter alternative thinking and positions become the dominant trade. Um, Frederica, as a, as a queer curator herself, has been personally tired of, you know, acting as the correction uh, subject on panels dominated by white heterosexual males. And myself, as a heterosexual white curator, have argued or have um, struggled tremendously to steer clear of an over-representation of white male artists, uh, despite our knowledges of this. Secondly, uh, all our projects are transnational, uh, meaning that we involve practitioners from around the globe with diverse cultural, political and social backgrounds. We believe that no thematic or problematic can be fully comprehended outside of the dynamics of globalization, and thus a global perspective is essential for generating contemporary notions of solidarity and accountability across borders. Lastly, all our projects are interdisciplinary. Uh, we're interested in the interdisciplinary exchange of critical strategies from different agents and different fields. And only through that can we perhaps produce uh, valid alternatives to the current world order. Uh, rethinking Nordic colonialism unfolded as a major transnational multidisciplinary exhibition project and it set out to revisit the colonial past of the Nordic region. The intentions of the project were twofold. On the one hand, uh, we wanted to examine why this history of Nordic colonialism has been forgotten or repressed in the collective memory of the once colonizing Scandinavian countries. And on the other, we wanted to show how perhaps the rising problems of intolerance, xenophobia, heterosexism, and nationalism in the Nordic societies today have their structural roots in this history. Um, when I say that there is an amnesia or a repression of this colonial past, um, it is both within the Nordic region and without. Uh, when we did the project, we received numerous surprised uh, reactions. Um, has there ever been? Has Scandinavia participated in the, in the European modern colonialist project? Um, why don't we know about that? And within the Scandinavian region as such, post-colonial um, or colonialism was regarded as something that happened far away outside of Scandinavia to other populations, other peoples. Um, all through primary school, we received no education on our colonial past. And so this project sort of picked up on this amnesia. The project unfolded in five consecutive acts, just like a theater play in the former, and in some cases, arguably still, colonized territories of Iceland, which used to be a colony of Denmark until 1945. Greenland, which is still a colony of Denmark. Greenland has home rule, but we control its foreign policies. The Faroe Islands, which is also still a Danish colony with home rule and Finnish Sápmi, uh, which is the Finnish part of the Sámi people's homeland area, which um, trans, uh, crosses across four nation states, Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Russia. Each of the four first acts um, hosted an art exhibition, a film program, and a public event. Each of them were different. And Act 5 uh, consisted of the publication of a DVD, and a website which documented and contextualized the many activities and conclusions generated during the first four acts. This DVD was then released uh, in the Scandinavian capitals uh, by the end of the year, uh, whereby the voices finally reached the once colonizing uh, populations of Scandinavia. We deliberately wanted with this structure to bypass the eccentric tendencies of the institution NIFCA. Uh, NIFCA was supposed to uh, work throughout the Nordic region but had only conducted projects in the Scandinavian centers and the Baltic area, thereby depriving the, the peripheries of Greenland, the Faroe Islands, uh, Sápmi and um, uh, Iceland of major international art events. 
It was also uh, deliberate in the sense that we wanted to apply a curatorial uh, methodology which allowed for the direct exchange between post-colonial subjects of the Nordic region and of the South, literally bringing together post-colonial practitioners from, say, Indonesia, Malaysia, the Caribbean, Africa, and bringing them to the North and exchanging with people there. And thereby we hope to create the conditions for um, knowledge born outside of this North-South divide to be articulated across it. This in turn allowed uh, so-called privileged uh, subjects of the once colonizing nations to sort of listen and learn from the post-colonial subjects and reversing the West's cultural hegemony. It also enabled an engagement with the post-colonial as a set of other formations of modernity and a process of unthinking old binary systems. Uh, Saddam Harais has <coughs> recently described rethinking Nordic colonialism as this. What seemed to me to be a fruitful element in your activity was that at the very moment when you felt you had to be alert to listening to a whole other universe of sound and voice and articulation of the world, a kind of exchange was beginning where a new object of knowledge is being born. A new continent is coming into being a new continent of analysis, a new continent of thinking, a new continent of knowledge. It created the conditions for the emergence of a new body of knowledge about how we engage with those who normally get classified somewhere on the axis of the north-south divide. Suddenly we find that the north-south divide that we have assumed to be the wealthy north and the poor south is now framed in a very different way. We are seeing marginal voices of North and South talking to each other, cutting across that axis and saying that the world can be interpreted in a very different way. We can see a whole colonized consciousness emerging out of its colonized condition and coming to connect with each other. And you as mobilizers, meaning us, Kurtoisk Aktion, also begin to see yourselves in a new way and begin to struggle to find a role in this. How am I doing on time? Um, I think you got another 10 minutes. Okay, great. So let me take you through um, some of the activities that happened during Rethinking Nordic Colonialism. This is the DVD, which basically functions as an off-site uh, website documenting the project. It's available online for free, and I also have copies here. The DVD basically contains information about all the different uh, art exhibitions um, in Iceland, Greenland, the Faroe Islands, and Finnish Sápmi, the film program, the various public events, behind the scenes photos, um, essays and papers uh, produced during the project, which can be printed out. Uh, local reports on how the project functioned in each location and uh, press material and press coverage. You can basically access all um, information uh, generated during the project. Each project um, or each, each act had a different thematic um, Act one sort of looked specifically at how, why we why we have this amnesia regarding this history. What are the mechanisms of, of repression? Uh, and Act two then went further and looked at the geopolitical and economical interest in maintaining colonies within the Nordic region. Act three then went further on a micro level and investigated aspects of mental colonization. Uh, how colonialism acts on body and mind, and what strategies of mental decolonizations uh, are necessary. And Act 4 finally looked at the colonialism within Scandinavia, not only towards the indigenous Sami people of the north, but towards uh, immigrants and asylum seekers.
This is a short video tour of the first exhibition in Iceland. I'm going to show you a little abstract. Divodit is a Trinidad-based uh, artist and theorist, and his project basically asked the, the viewer to sign a contract um, engaging in the process of rethinking Nordic colonialism. Marion Jaffrey, a Pakistani-American artist based in Denmark currently, um, looked at historical archives of European colonialism and compared them with contemporary media coverage of the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan, linking the colonialism of the past with uh, uh, the war on terror today. Greenlandic artist Inuk Silishø and Asmon Haustein Mikkelsen from Denmark did a project where they tried to recruit audiences to join the Greenlandic army in the invasion or the colonialization of Greenland. Another Greenlandic artist, Julia Edel Hardenberg, who did a series of passport photographs where she passes as any um, other ethnic identity or subject. And I'm going to cut it short here because I'm running out of time. Um, In Greenland in Act 2, um, we also hosted an art exhibition uh, and a public hearing, uh, and I'm going to play a short audio sample from that hearing uh, made by um, M. Shaki Alexander, a queer theorist um, from Trinidad and Tobago. Our job, I believe, in being involved in a radical project 
I want to call this a radical project. The talk about decolonization is a radical project. Yeah? Think part about job and being involved in a radical project is being able to move across the boundaries in which we have been put placed. Those might be boundaries of nation state. Those might be boundaries of class. They might be boundaries of race. They might be boundaries of gender. They might be boundaries of sexuality. They might be boundaries of nationality. Whichever boundaries that we have inherited, our work has to be to cross those boundaries so that we can begin to see the relationship amongst things. Not in order to see that they are all equal because there is inequality, but at least to see that there is relationship amongst them. Relationship amongst them. So that's one of our tasks. That's one. The second thing is that decolonization is a project for everyone. 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 Even those who consider themselves superior. Decolonization is a project for everyone, since everyone has been colonized in some way. You may be colonized into superiority, you may be colonized into inferiority, but colonization is colonization. And so the job of decolonization is a job for everyone. And the third point that I want to make is that to move from colonization into conviviality, or to move from colonization into solidarity, requires hard work and requires practice. Practice. If we imagine or we have a vision for a different kind of life that we want to live, we have to begin practicing it. It doesn't simply come and be given to us on a platter. We have to begin that hard work of practicing it. And that's the last point that I will make. Thank you. And the last thing I want to show you is a, a few images from the behind the scenes. Because what happened during the project, which I've been trying to, to speak about maybe in two abstract terms, was um, that you had a situation in Nuuk, in the public hearing, for instance, where Shakir Alexander would make a statement like this and discuss uh, various proposals posed by other post-colonial states, the, the re truth and reconciliation process of South Africa, for instance, with Mashe Kualanga, a South African artist, or um, strategies of uh, retribution or apology with, with the Danish participants. And it was truly this moment where the expertise, knowledge on the post-colonial condition came from post-colonial practitioners and the, for, the, the subjects of the former colonizers uh, couldn't contribute really with anything but listened and learned. It was a, it was a situation where privileged knowledge came from the so-called underdeveloped world and I think this is what was really remarkable about the project and what I characterize as curating across the north-south divide. And this whole situation of, of, of bringing all these post-colonial practitioners together in these uh, remote areas also did something um, remarkable. This is again images from the, the new part of Nuuk. Um, Nuuk is the capital of Greenland. Um, has mimicked um, the Danish uh, governmental administration system. Denmark remains its control of, of Greenland and the Faroe Islands, we found out during the project. Not so much because Greenland is full of natural resources, which we're bound to get hold of sooner or later, but because small Denmark with this giant continent of Greenland and the Faroe Islands, in fact, constitute a major nation within NATO and has been able to provide the U.S. free airspace um, all the way from America uh, through Europe to Afghanistan and Iraq. Denmark has participated in or conducted what you could say soft colonialism where we haven't forbidden um, 
the post uh, the colonial subjects to speak their own language. Uh, Danish is still the first language both in Greenland and the Faroe Islands, but people are allowed to speak their original languages. Uh, but we have conducted a sort of soft colonialism, creating an e economical uh, and structural dependency between the colonies and Denmark. We provide Greenland and Denmark with small financial subsidies each year, which by far is smaller than what rebate Denmark gets in NATO for making up such a big territory, and uh, is far less than what we gain on um, taxes because all goods to Greenland and the Faroe Islands has to go through Denmark. So behind the scenes sort of show the conviviality, the, the, the social interaction between all these people we brought to these sites and their interaction with local audiences there. And again, Greenland mm. as, a, as a nation is not used to big international art events, um, and we try to fix that. Thank, yeah, thanks a lot, Tom. Okay. Thank you. now like to ask Eden Kosova to take the microphone. Eden is an art critic based in Istanbul. Um, he can, he's contributing um, as a writer and editor to contemporary art magazines such as um, Artis. Um, and he was a co-curator of an exhibition together with Kat Katerina Gregos in 2005 in Nicosia, um, using working on both sides of the Cyprus divide. I think it, that sometimes it was difficult for you to get from one side to the other, but um, working with uh, the Greek and the um, Turkish parts of the divided island. Um, he now also works for the Istanbul-based socialist newspaper Birgun, uh, and he's a member of the um, post-anarchist collective in Istanbul, which runs the ma uh, magazine project uh, Siyahi. Uh, he's also currently a PhD candidate at Goldsmiths. Erdan, thanks very much. <coughs> okay, I'm taking the revenge. Last night, when we were on the dinner, Charles came up with a hat uh, of the football team Galatasaray, <laughs> which is the arch enemy of <laughs> the football team I support. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> I came with that top not to humiliate uh, the possible PSV supporters in the audience <laughs> as regards to the match 10 days ago. <laughs> uh, just but just to explain why the call for absolute uh, identification with national belonging uh, has failed in my personality. So when I was five years old, um, the teachers at the preschool education has taught us a song, a kind of patri patriotic song, which went like, um, the sails of the Turks have the color of red, and the sails of the um, ships of the enemy has the color blue, meaning, of course, the arch enemy Greece. And I was like, you know, why the hell? You know, I'm, you know, oh, I always have been, let's say, identifying with the color blue. You know, wh wh why not changing the colors? And what was wrong with being Greek? Because 
the person um, you see on the image who is the most ever best player throughout the, throughout the uh, history of Turkish um, football is from uh, Greek identity, from um, Istanbul, um, from the Istanbul Greeks, whose name is Leftar Kuchuk Andonianis. And uh, I would say th throughout my life, the rest of my life, I always fail to identify with this, uh, pure Turkishness. Um, I mean, the word Turkishness will um, cause some trouble for the, some of the people uh, in the recent past, in a couple of years. So, uh, also there were details, just to name them, I mean, Fener, uh, the word Fener is also the um, um, place, the neighborhood, I mean, it's not the same neighborhood as Fenerbahce, but uh, Fener uh, is the place where the Orthodox Patriarchy is, pla is placed, and uh, Kadiköy had a kind of Greek, uh, Greek uh, population in the past, and then the football pitch was even called uh, the green fields of the papas, which means the orthodox priest. So uh, I also remember, which is also a kind of uh, strange moment for me, that a family friend of mine who was supporting Galatasaray sent me a kind of uh, um, an image through int internet, uh, which had um, this um, t map of Greece and Turkey side by side. And then uh, the flags of the two countries have superimposed on the, onto the maps. So Greek flag onto Greece and Turkish flag um, onto uh, Turkey. And then the, but the colors were a little bit different. Um, instead of white and blue, it was uh, yellow, and, yellow and dark blue. And uh, the color of the Turkey was um, red and white, uh, red and yellow instead of uh, red and white. And uh, it was like, you know, Fenerbahce has been portrayed as the outside uh, element um, in this whole thing. Um, and then the person who sent it to me was from Armenian origin. So I'm just, I'm just, I just gave this kind of uh, introduction just to show how the belated nationalism of a, a multi-ethnic imperial p power uh, struggles to um, hold a kind of uh, coherency uh, in terms of um, current politics. And, um, well, I have been a kind of part of a constellation of artists who, let's say, approach to contemporary art just as a kind of reaction to what happened in the mid-90s, as a kind of um, cry, uh, scream against the um, traumas which, which were have been, uh, which were, which have been, uh, which had been uh, experienced in the mid-90s, uh, namely the, um, let's say, the climax of the civil war between the Turkish army and the um, Kurdish separatist army. Um, and uh, you know the tension between the Islamic movement and then the secular uh, state system, and then let's say traumatic events like uh, the massacring of 37 intellectuals in uh, Sivas by um, fundamentalists um, who have been burned in a hotel, and um, you know that kind of stuff, uh, which were create, which create a kind of hell house kind of atmosphere in the country. So uh, perhaps, I mean, I, perhaps this is my reading, and uh, I'm also kind of uh, putting my kind of uh, um, version on the whole uh, portrayal of the expansion of the contemporary art in Istanbul. But I mean, I think many people would, like, would agree that uh, there is a kind of uh, um, a political en engagement in the main body of what has been produced in Turkey uh, uh, in the recent past. Uh, which has a kind of cultural specificity. And um, I mean, instead of kind of epistemological uh, questionings about what art is or a kind of experimentation on the new media or this kind of uh, um, contemplation on the conceptual uh, dimensions of the art practice, 
there will, has been a, a kind of clear um, occupation with um, the local traumas, um, the, polit the political uh, kind of issues, um, ranging from the repression of the state uh, to um, the distribution of uh, social space uh, through gender codifications. Um, at that time, in the mid 90s, there was this kind of first wave. I mean, the first wave I have witnessed, of course, there were previously more waves of nationalism, but the first uh, wave of nationalism uh, has been lived uh, um, in the second part of the 90s, and the adopt and uh, the ultra nationalists' rhetoric have been adopted by uh, the right of the center, and it got popularized in the mass media, the, the whole iconography, and then this kind of, I think it's, it was a kind of uh, um, a response to the self-confidence uh, of, of for, for the national uh, belonging, um, which accompanied the economic expansion in the 90s, and also this kind of new energies which re have been released in the aftermath of the uh, collapse of the uh, Soviet bloc. And um, for at that period for us, the picture was very clear. You know, there was a fight between left and right, and then um, by adopting the language of the uh, ultranationalists, um, the right of the center um, displayed its own uh, character. You know, the real right was now evident. We thought, and then um, people like me thought that. You know, the counterpart will be uh, um, the articulation of a proper left, which will uh, claim this cosmopolitan, non-nationalist um, view. And I think a contem contemporary art has also sympathized with this bloc, um, uh, who, which uh, tried to elaborate on an uh, anti-statist, anti-militarist, and uh, um, what was the other? Um, anti religion I think that came l later or uh, that never played a part anyway so there was this kind of uh, um, guerrilla type of attitude which was played out um, in the works but one detail was that it never had the touch um, to the public it, it didn't properly negotiate in the public space because at that time there was rarely any place to exhibit these works. And then um, all this kind of uh, discursive mediation of these works were happening either in the you know, exclusive art magazines as ours or um, in, the sp in the space of uh, Central European art institutions. And then... Um, um, George W. Bush came to power, and then uh, there was the um, occupation of Iraq in, uh, in 2003, and then a second wave of nationalism came, which displaced all these conventional um, kind of uh, divisions between left and right. The whole political scape has uh, completely shifted, and then the, uh, the ultra-nationalist rhetoric was also adopted by a uh, wider range of uh, what we have conceived as left. So something like nas uh, leftist nationalism has emerged, which is a, a kind of freak uh, kind of uh, segment within uh, the whole political um, landscape. And then there were this kind of new alliances. Uh, just to summarize, um, the fascist, the army, the anti-EU, the ex-social uh, democrats, the Kemalists, the ex-Maoists, -Ma some part of the communists have came together to defend this national bloc, whereas the other part was mostly com co composed of um, the ex-Islamic, now conservative liberal, it's a little bit oxymoron, but um, you know, conservative liberal uh, party who is uh, governing uh, the country, the liberals, the bourgeoisie, uh, socialists, pro-EUs, and um, Kurdish um, society. Um, it's, it might sound a little bit, you know, hard to conceive, but um, 
there was a really uh, kind of quite tension and then there was a threat of military coup and even um, kind of threats for a civil war which we have which uh, the country has not uh, trans um, transgress uh, trans um, get, could avoid yet I mean uh, you know what is happening right now in northern Iraq so um, <clears throat> what happened with this tension is also this kind of um, specialization of contemporary art because in the last two or three years there was new institutions opening not only the established mainstream ones but also independent ones so the contemporary art which had a, this kind of transgressive, transgressive nature became visible and then it um, the space of uh, um, the spatial uh, location of uh, the contemporary art has also became vulnerable to the attacks from the um, outside which I try to map out in a very swiftly and uh, briefly. I, my apologies to the people in the uh, seminar because I'm repeating nearly what I have said before on Wednesday. So this, um, this is a, uh, the, in 2005, along the biennial, uh, which was created by Charles Ishan and Wallace of Corton, they were in a parallel, parallel event. I think this was not included in the frame of the biennial, but um, an exhibition in a place called Karsi Sanat, which, was a, which is an independent art space. There was this exhibition of uh, the photographs of the pogrom, which um, uh, targeted the uh, non-Muslim minorities uh, uh, in Istanbul, mostly uh, the shops uh, around the Istiklal Street. So um, a kind of military judge uh, had to take pictures and uh, after 50 years he came up uh, with his photographs and then exhibited in, in this place. And then on the opening night it was raided by the ultra-nationalists and uh, the photographs were torn down um, and then thrown to the uh, Istiklal Street and then it was like the repeating of what happened 50 years ago. So it was also for a big shock for us because we thought uh, this, you know, art galleries, art spaces were a kind of safe heaven for, uh, even for the most transgressive uh, art practices um, in the past. So, but uh, we realized that um, it was not really so safe. So it was a combined kind of attack organized by fascists and uh, this ex-Maoists who, you know, these two segments who killed each other in the 70s, in the 70s. And then there was this, I mean, uh, I think uh, in Wanabe there was this presentation of uh, what happened uh, on the 19th January of uh, 2007 by Ahmed Ud and Esra Sergedik. Am I correct? Yes. Um, so this there were, a, a assassination happened, which um, uh, was a huge uh, shock on the uh, leftist intelligentsia. Uh, most loved, I mean, the one of the most loved uh, personalities in the whole scene, um, a journalist um, of Armenian origin who was critical. <laughs> both to the Turkish uh, nationalist ideology and also the Armenian diasporic uh, ideology uh, was killed by a fascist. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, we came to a point of, you know, considering where we stand, what we do, uh, as, along with uh, thousands of people. So 200,000 people came together uh, for the funeral, and uh, it was the first. I mean, it was the first time that you could um, hear such a slogan as stated in this um, um, in the photograph. We are all Hrant, his forename Hrant Ding, and we are all Armenian. And it was a kind of qu quite, quite uh, displacing uh, kind of sentence for the who. 
uh, a kind of blow to the um, this kind of uh, taboos of the national identity. I mean, Armenians always have to keep silent and never make their identity visible and and so on. So it was also a kind of um, moment in which artists had to think about their position in terms of the social uh, issues and uh, how their spatial, how how this the, how the appreciation of their works uh, can be delivered to the public and. Uh, um, so, one segment of the whole uh, scene uh, felt like they should radicalize their um, voice. So, all these banners have been, I'm not sure about this information, but most probably uh, been uh, designed by a guy who is the uh, husband of Aisha Arkman, one of the most prominent contemporary artists, and he um, actually was uh, the initiator, one of the most effective, uh, influential initiators of the uh, expansion of Turkish contemporary art in the 80s. And he's still uh, very influential on um, graphic design. And then, um, um, I mean, if he didn't design this, it is still his, his uh, fonts and uh, style. And then a uh, younger, uh, friend of ours came with a kind of obituary um, um, advertisement um, which had this kind of small conceptual intervention on the dates. It was like Quran Dick died but uh, you know his death uh, date is perhaps the date in which he was born and then he opened up a kind of path to negotiate and to internalize what happened in 1915 um, to the Armenian population in Anatolia. And then, um, you know, it will only be kind of the mission of his uh, uh, intellectual life only be accomplished when um, the society will come in terms with what happened. I can't get much into detail to it, but uh, of course, there is this kind of contra appropriation of it. So this is a kind of the leftist uh, newspaper in the 80s, but now turned into this nationalist discourse. And then he got the same kind of image, uh, the same concept, and then uh, applied to um, the life of um, Atatürk, the founder of the republic. So they put the birth date of him, and then. I mean, they were warning whether you know, when the this uh, Islamic um, government got also the presidency, uh, then Atatürk will be bu um, completely buried, buried his ideology and, and so on. So, in this kind of psychological atmos atmosphere, uh, in the first week of after the um, assassination. Uh, a performance uh, group uh, called the uh, Barefoot Company uh, came to the streets and then just repeating uh, the uh, position of the dead body of Grant uh, in front of uh, the place where he was killed uh, with um, 100 people. And uh, it is the first time that a kind of politically engaged work came really onto the streets. And uh, it is one of my main arguments that the whole uh, politically uh, engaged works uh, have missing the two dimension, uh, the three dimensionality. They have this per uh, lacking the uh, performational dimension and always collapsing to the screen of the video, the screen of the video and the photographs. So the political message uh, has never been properly brought uh, to the public, um, and it is one of the exceptions uh, what you see here. So, well, again, at this kind of answer didn't uh, answer from the nationalist bloc uh, was not late. Uh, so hundreds of thousands of people took the streets with Turkish flags um, as a kind of protest against the government, mostly motivated by the military uh, militaristic propaganda. 
And then on the more violent cases, uh, there were this kind of attempts to lynch uh, uh, leftist guys, you know, communists or human rights activists who try to um, s um, read out a kind of uh, declaration. Uh, and then they were, they were attacked by fascist guys um, on, onto this, on the streets of many cities. So on the last biennial, there was this kind of ironical uh, project of Burak Deliar, who uh, kind of worked on production of a lynch-proof uh, jacket. So um, it had this kind of devices for an activist. You know, uh, you can hide your um, spray and then leaflets and so on. And then uh, there are this kind of uh, soft sections in which uh, you can be protected from the police raid or lynching. And um, there were also this kind of uh, images in which the contemporary artist sees to be, uh, sees uh, th suspended the uh, status of being an artist and then they got to this kind of uh, guerrilla war against a kind of a visual struggle against uh, um, this actually existing uh, nationalism. Um, this is from the same artist uh, who played with um, the flag of the uh, fascist party and also the Ottoman flag, which was composed of three crescents. Uh, he replaced with, uh, them with bananas. And then this kind of bio damage uh, was mm, the, the name of this one. And um, of course, I mean, the message is clear, I guess. Yeah, I mean, uh, so as a kind of conclusion, I would say, um, and we can touch on it on to the later discussions, uh, there's this kind of justification problem about contemporary art. Uh, this is a completely uh, different detail, but this kind of opening up of uh, these big spaces in the in Istanbul, uh, let's say Istanbul Modern, Central Istanbul, and then this kind of uh, places which is which are um, supported by the, uh, the banks or big uh, bourgeois families, uh, have created a different atmosphere. And then um, I will say this kind of uh, um, venues are either kind of recuperating what has been done, um, putting this kind of politically um, transgressive work into completely sterile venues. And uh, also, uh, there's this kind of huge debate about the biennial, um, mostly the last one uh, created by Hu Hanru. And then uh, contemporary art as such, as a kind of complete field, became this kind of target uh, of um, this um, nationalist bloc, and it was seen and portrayed uh, by them as, uh, you know, the most corrupted, the most decadent, and the most sold out um, cultural uh, field on the whole um, social life. But we can get to it into the discussion. Thank you for the patience. I'd like to move swiftly along to Galit, if your computer is ready. Um, Galit is um, director and founder of the Digital Arts Lab in Holon, which is a suburb of uh, Tel Aviv in uh, Jerusalem. Um, she's also chief editor of Marav, an online magazine um, for art and culture, published in Hebrew and sometimes with some uh, elements in English. Um, She's been responsible for uh, that space, uh, the Digital Arts Lab in Holon, uh, since 2001 has cu and has curated many exhibitions, many of which touch on a lot of these questions uh, that we have dealt with from a Nordic or from a Turkish perspective as well. She's also teaching at uh, Tel Aviv University and is one of the main uh, motivators, coordinators and drivers behind a project which has uh, now lasted um, nearly two years called Liminal Spaces, which is an attempt to look at the territory of Israel and Palestine or the occupied territories 
uh, of the West Bank um, and to uh, analyze in a way um, through actual experience uh, what might be going on there and what possibilities might exist. I hope I've done a long enough introduction for you to start the computer. Thank you very much, Galit. I will start a bit with uh, with the center to talk about the center um, and what we are doing there, and then I will go to uh, a few projects. Um, but one of the main questions that I'm dealing today is um, the Israeli art scene, mainly characterized by being part of the left or the active left, and uh, a lot of artists participate in different kind of demonstration and action against the occupation. Um, the art scene supported strongly by the government, by the establishment, and the establishment in Israel from the 80s are um, right government. Um, so this kind of link uh, and connection or the silent agreement between the art establishment and the um, state establishment in something that I'm dealing with um, because a lot of artists, even if they are protest on the street or with the work, in the end they are supported and occupied by, by the state. So this is kind of a loop um, that I find very frustrating and very interesting. Israel um, marked, marked herself, uh, itself as a, the only democracy in the Middle East. In one um, of the presentations that I gave a friend of mine, Jacques Pasikian, say, you must say Israel and Palestine are the only democracies in the Middle East. So here I'm saying it, Israel and Palestine are the only democracies. Um, okay, here at the center, how it looked like uh, three years ago. Um, and it's important because in the end, I will return to the architect that I work with around, uh, around the center. Uh, it's located in a, in a, in a um, um, the suburb area on the industrial area of Holon, which Holon is also kind of periphery of Tel Aviv. So it's the periphery of the periphery. Um, it's located in an old school, and until three years ago, it was completely invisible to the neighborhood. Um, we changed this with a, with a great architect, young architect, uh, that opened the center to the to the uh, neighborhood. So. I can't say that now the neighbors are entering like, to any exhibition or attending any one of the discussion, but still in the afternoon they are um, sitting here on, on, um, on the grass and children are playing football, and, and etc. So it's become this space, the public space, become very active. And we have kind of connection. They know that we have a fax machine in the office, so they can come and send a fax from the office. So we have very nice uh, a neighbor uh, relation. This is how the space... Uh, um, look at the evenings and sometimes this is the inside space, um, the garden that we have sometimes, a, a music band, electronic band. Um, I will go to um, two exhibitions we made in the space and then to liminal spaces. Uh, um, this exhibition was on the focus of the uh, unrecognized villages. In Israel there are more than uh, 700 uh, villages, uh, Bedouin villages are now um, Palestinian and Bedouin villages. Some of them are cities, but we used to call them villages. It's not really important how many citizens are living in the city or in the village or uh, their villages. Uh, here we see um, uh, work by uh, Tal Adler that work around the issues of uh, the unrecognized villages. Uh, he stayed like a few months with the uh, villager in, in the south of Israel, in the Negev. Uh, here we, in the image we, uh, we are um, watching um, a mosque that demolished three times 
So every year they're building the mosque and every year the Israeli authorities coming and destroying uh, the mosque. So this kind of uh, strategy Israel apply also to uh, Palestinian villages. They don't destroy the whole village, they don't destroy and not uh, evacuating uh, the population, but they're destroying part of the main, um, main um, let's say, uh, or it's connected to, to religion or the infrastructure. So uh, Israeli authorities can uh, close the uh, water pipe or not uh, reconstruct uh, the roads to the village. Um, so the people have to struggle, like everyday life become very uh, very hard struggling. Instead, instead of to uh, destroy the whole village, y they are not fixing or just destroying part of it. Um, the importance was, um, with the exhibition also to show it to the um, um, people that living in the center or the uh, people that coming to the art lovers to be aware of what happened in the uh, um, Bedouin uh, villages. Um, now Bedouin, Cherkes, uh, Druzian are all uh, minorities that today identify themselves with the Palestinians. So I will say Palestinian instead of Bedouins, I think it's a uh, uh, it's a more proper uh, ex expression. Or um, this exhibition, it's traveling. It's traveled all over Israel, and now it's traveling. I think now it's traveling to the U.S. So it will travel also to Europe. I think next stop after the U.S. will be in Vienna. Uh, I think it will be next month. Uh, one of the important things was around this project that the um, people from the village was very much involved. Uh, to any one of the photos, there is a story, the story behind the photo, and there is a catalog with all the story uh, that uh, Tal uh, collect. Um, so we can see here something which is a bit unusual to uh, an art space, that people from the, uh, the village came to see uh, the exhibition and to celebrate the, the opening. And later on, they're following the discussion all over, they follow the, uh, the discussion uh, uh, in, in Israel. Uh, information room that we are most of the time providing with any one of the exhibitions. Uh, another exhibition uh, that was open, I think it was last year, uh, called Forbidden Games. We collect games from uh, uh, around the Middle East, from Syria, from Lebanon, uh, from Israel, and some uh, games that develop also in, in Denmark. Um, this, especially this game, it's very interesting. Um, the the one on the on the right, it's an old game from the first Intifada. Uh, you you see uh, one uh, soldier, Israeli soldier, fight with a lot of Palestinians. Uh, they use, uh, of course, um, uh, uh, stones. Uh, the first Intifada was called the, the Intifada of the Stones or Intifada of the People, and. Uh, and on top you have the uh, defense ministry. If you use too much, if you are playing and use too much uh, gas tear or uh, um, plastic bullets, so the uh, um, uh, defense ministry changed to uh, someone which is more leftist and on the opposite. If you don't use, if you use just gas tears and you don't use, don't use a plastic bullet and etc. Uh, and there is a definition between, uh, there is a difference between uh, plastic bullet, rubber bullet, gas tear, in how it's harmed, and etc. And the other game, it's developed during the Second Intifada by uh, uh, a Syrian activist. And it's, uh, uh, it's oh, oh, again, it's, it's reflect the First Intifada, not the second one. And here you can see like one Palestinian guy uh, fighting with a lot of, uh, half of the Israeli army. Um, yeah, this is, this is other games. It was a Kuma War. I don't know if you know. It's a, it's an online game, a community game. Uh, it's developed by the Americans. I think the American army use it because in the end you can like um, go to the uh, American army and sign on a contract or something. You can play as American soldiers, and then you have like a kind of an ethical rule, uh, not to hurt uh, innocent people and etc. This is another uh, interesting game. Uh, and this game developed um, as, 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 a, as a, a counterpoint to the uh, Kuma War. It's Night of uh, Bush uh, Capturing. Uh, it's a game that developed by Al-Qaeda. We had uh, games that developed by Al-Qaeda, by the Hezbollah. And it was uh, just after uh, Lebanon War. 
and we collect some of the games that develop in the Israeli side and the Lebanese side dealing with with the uh, uh, with the war. Uh, one of the idea was not just to analyze and to deal with the uh, um, digital game and the uh, uh, the um, uh, game community. It was how to start a dis discussion around the situation with young people, not just uh, with art lovers or the um, usual uh, visitor in the, in the museum, how to invite to the space young people that most of the time are not so much interested in art, and to start the discussion and to enter to a um, kind of situation that they play the others, like they play the games that the uh, Palestinian uh, develop and they fighting uh, the Israeli army, so young people before or during the, the service play this game and create kind of a lot of discussion about identity and how you identified yourself in the game itself with, with the others and about the strategy, so uh, quotes like uh, during the game, oh they are good, who are the, they? They are the Israeli, they are the Palestinians, who we are. So it's created a lot of uh, uh, very interesting discussion around this uh, exhibition. Oh, here's the uh, bigger uh, screen about uh, print screen. Okay, um, a lot of um, the computer game also function as a, a propaganda. As you see, uh, this is from the Palestinian, the stone throwers. That was the opposite to the uh, Intifada game. So you have um, those screen inside the game. This is from the Al Qaeda game, yes. And um, there is uh, Counter Strike. Counter Strike is kind of a very popular game uh, that you can hack and change part of the scene. So in one of the games, we found this one, which is not related to the game. It's just a screen that I find very uh, interesting. We have the wall, we have Microsoft, we have the IDF, and we have the Bedouins, uh, the, the Bedouin guy with, with the ship. I don't know why those four layers, but. Um, and why is Microsoft image behind, but probably it's the Americans and all the icons together. Um, and here we had like a flash game that developed during, uh, during the, the war. Here you can beat Nastrala, and et cetera, like kind of a funny games. Other thing that we are uh, doing, we're not just dealing with the uh, uh, occupation, uh, so I go fast through other things like electronic music, so the, we deal with different kind of uh, scene um, in Israel. This is uh, uh, the name of this in the name of this installation. It's the brother of the pipe. Um, it, you have a pipe all over, and you have a sensors, microphone, and um, yeah, it generates sound that goes through the computer, etc. Um, liminal spaces. Liminal spaces started um, almost two years ago. It's a collaboration between uh, Rim Feda, uh, which now she's the um, academic uh, director of uh, uh, Palestinian, uh, the, uh, the Academy of Art Palestine uh, in Ramallah. Uh, Phil Mazelwitz, uh, he is an architect. He moved uh, last month to Istanbul from Berlin. He lived for a while in Israel, and his main research is uh, uh, refugee camp. He works now around uh, the Heishe refugee camp um, and um, the Israeli Center for Digital Art, which is, I think, it's one of the first and only uh, kind of collaboration. Collaboration is not the right word. Be we're trying to uh, develop other way of describe this kind of uh, coming to an action and other ways how to describe our our activities. Uh, but I think it's one, uh, um, almost the only one uh, project that Art Institute and also Palestinian Institute working together on on, on different level. So I I will show you a, a short presentation and then. Uh, I can talk about the project and the last project, which are not here. We will see a uh, kind of a very short and high pr presentation around first liminal spaces and the second one. The first was uh, um, started was in March, March 2000, 
six. Um, it was around road number one, road number 60, uh, which are um, 500 meters from uh, Kalandia checkpoint. Kalandia checkpoint is the main or the biggest checkpoint between Jerusalem and the territories. This um, behind us, it's uh, all the um, all it's a furniture shop uh, where we had a conference. It was very small, I think half, maybe less of this space, and we've been like around 60 people for three days. It was very stressed, I think. Maybe later I can describe what happened during. But good morning again. Okay, I, I, I will say something about what happened in the first one, the second one, maybe later we will have time to um, um, look on some of the works. Um, so, at the first liminal spaces, we um, travel mainly uh, around uh, road number 60, as I say, it's the road that, co that connect between Jerusalem and Ramallah. Uh, we travel through um, um, Kalandia refugee camp, Elbire, and Ramallah. Um, later on, I have I have in my bag some uh, maps, etc. The ones that want to see. Um, it was the first three days of the project. It was just after the Hamas elected um, us, and I, when I say us, the Israeli, we are not allowed to be there. The, uh, this area called area uh, zone A. Um, and Israeli are not allowed to be there. So it was a lot of uh, stress, pressure um, from both sides. Rim, a day before that we, the, the, op, um, the con conference, the seminar opened, she contacted uh, the Tanzim, 
the Tanzim, it's the army force of, uh, of the Fatah uh, to protect us, especially when we're entering to, uh, um, to the refugee camp. To and another thing that we made before, like a few weeks before, we sent all the texts and all the information to Birzet University to the boycott uh, committee. Uh, we made this like, normally I don't know how you will feel, but for me it was very strange just to send my text to somebody that can censorize my text, to politically correct me. Uh, but it was very important to do, uh, to allow to the um, Palestinian artists that participate in, in the project to uh, work in, inside the norm of their own society. So it was very important for them to get this kind of approval uh, from the uh, boycott committee. I don't know the one that don't know. There is a academic and uh, cultural boycott uh, um, around Israeli Institute. Um, so it was, yeah, it was, um, I will not go to the um, uh, every one of the days, but the second, the second conference was in Leipzig and it was, I think for all the group, it was a bit, um, strange situation because to go from the local, from the certain place, from cer researching and getting like visual information, theoretical information, but all the time to have like a, a guided tour inside the place. So you have, you have all the time the feeling of the, sp of the space, you know, how it's look like. It's not just to, to, to hear about the, the thing, and, but also to confront with. So the meeting in, Le in Leipzig was a bit um, difficult. Also, um, I think the relation or the triangle, uh, Germany, uh, Israel, Palestine, and the, the uh, discussion that can elaborate around, uh, around those topics was quite uh, hard. But one thing that happened, it was, I'm short, I have time? You've got about five minutes pushing. Five minutes, okay. Um, okay. Uh, okay, it was very problematic. The, the good thing that um, I think we, um, Israeli and Pal Palestinian, we find another army, it was Germany, the uh, German Institute, and the conference was about the responsibility of an art institute to certain kind of situations, so it's completely applied to our program. Uh, last uh, liminal spaces ended, I think, three or three weeks ago, I think, more or less it was. Oh, two weeks. Uh, three weeks? Okay, three weeks ago, and this time we look on the occupation inside Israel. Um, it's 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 acknowledged also in Israel that the occupation, yeah, yes, the territory, and the, this area is under occupation. I think there is not much dis discussion about what happened inside Israel. And to talk about Israel as occupied as um, a country which exists on other people' land. It's something which. It's very hard to discuss, it's, it's not acceptable from the right and from the left. Uh, we started a tour in Abu Ghosh, uh, which is a Palestinian village, it's very prosper. It's like the, one of the biggest, we call this uh, village, uh, the biggest restaurant in Israel because there is all the hummus places that people like visiting every other weekend. Uh, and we went to um, Bil'in, a village that uh, have kind of, um, yeah, maybe I, I can't go to any one of the, spaces, maybe I will talk about the all overall uh, idea. Okay, one, one of the things that uh, also was very difficult inside Israel and very difficult for us to operate is to talk about the occupation inside Israel, but there is another thing. There is a Palestinian living inside Israel. There are Israeli citizens. Uh, they're forced to, be, to hold Israeli ID. They are Palestinians, but they are the Palestinians that are living outside of Israel. And there is not much connections and not much information between those societies from 48. And uh, one of the things I think it was in this conference is to try and to uh, create kind of a contact and knowledge uh, between the, um, it's not two, it's between the Palestinian ins inside Israel and the Palestinians living outside of Israel. Um, I think this is my uh, best photo from last liminal spaces. Um, they just, I think, without knowing, sharing here the, the scarf. Uh, it's here in one of the top, but here is some photos. Uh, here is Bil'in. Bil'in case, it's, it's a very interesting case. It's a Palestinian village. The last three years, every Friday, there is a demonstration. 
demonstration against, uh, of course, the Israeli authorities that split the village by the fence so the people um, uh, from the village can, can't go uh, to their own land to work on them, like they have olive trees and uh, other agriculture. Um. <laughs> and I think three months ago they uh, succeed to, the, the case was on the court and they succeed to get the land back. So this is uh, one of good points, democracy. Uh, it's not all the land, they still have, uh, they still mm -hmm. there is a fence and uh, when we have been there we had to wake up the soldiers uh, to open the gate. Uh, people can stay like hours near the gate um, to be open, to go to work the land or just to get out. Um, so here are some photos. I'm, here's uh, one of, the, it's not the gate, there is another one. Um, now I can start the discussion. Just can mention I? this because I think it's a kind of important in terms of... Okay, um, there is something else that I want to discuss. It's like, you know, how, how come, what's happened with the Israeli art scene. So one thing, it's maybe that can uh, make it very simple to understand. This is UNESCO map of the, uh, you know, the, in, in UNESCO you have the culture map, how you know, uh, how they're dealing with certain uh, culture or communities. So Europe and, um, yeah, maybe we first look at the Arab states. So you have all the um, countries which are neighbor to Israel. Israel is not here, even the Middle East is here. But we are here. Here, this is very, very small thing. So we are in Europe and North America. So, um, and, and this is a long discussion, historical discussion, how come, how Israel, it's a white island, a European island, it's a, a white ghetto, um, different kind of expression how to describe Israel. But I think this is one of the main things that we are facing in the art scene, but also in culture, that Israel, it's kind of an um, island which are not connected to, uh, not regional, not uh, culturally, uh, in any matter to the, um, Neighbor, neighbor countries, and um, okay. Next year, uh, Israel will celebrate uh, 60 years of uh, um, uh, independence. But uh, two years ago, we already started to celebrate 100 years of Israeli art. So it was one big uh, exhibition in Martin Gropius. Um, as you see, Israel art and life from. Yeah, the last hundred years. So 60 years are not part of, and, and the Israeli art scene, like uh, next year, uh, six of the big museums decided to split between the six decades, each one of them going to uh, deal with uh, one decade. So six museums, the other are very disappointed because they are not participating in the national celebration. And this is something that it frustrates me very much, and it's a question. You know, if we talk about the function or how, what is the role of art museum in the national uh, state? So, in Israel, it's very easy. This is the role of museum in the national state. When you have, uh, when you celebrate uh, 60 years, 60 years of independence, so you have to celebrate it, and probably you will get a lot of money. So, Bezalel Academy, it's 100 years. Um, last year, during a Lebanon war. Um, um, too long? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. I wanted to leave some time for questions, so I apologize, Galit, for cutting you off, but uh, I hope it's, uh, it's useful. Um, thank you to all three of our participants. Um, I would like you to prepare some questions if you have, and we'll turn to you in a minute. Um, but one thing that struck me about all of you um, when you were talking was the extent to which the art projects that you were organizing, and I know this is also true for Erden and his publications, involved the kind of um, discursive model 
that we're also engaged in here. In other words, that the art project has developed far from the idea of the exhibition as the only model towards other, other models of discussion and other models of presentation. And I was just thinking or spinning a little bit about why that was or what was the, what was, what was the issues at stake that led us to need to want to talk to, it, to each other as much as we want to see and consume visually art. And it seemed to me that maybe one way of understanding it or thinking about it was, um, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, it's just, a, it's just a guess at the moment, is this idea that we're really struggling to try and define the nature of the problem itself. Even though it seems that in the cases, say, of, of, of Grant Dink's murder or the case of the occupation, there are very clear existing real problems. I mean, there are clear, there's clear, clearly suffering going on also in, 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 in uh, some parts of, of the North as well, um, which is an easy kind of sociological definition of a problem. But it seems that actually um, if the art and cultural field can say anything about that, it's about defining them in a different way from the classic political discourse. The political discourse at the moment defines the problem and the, the, the expectation of, of art and culture, I think traditionally maybe, has been to react to those definitions as though they're given. So in other words, to have a fairly firm ground where we agree what the problems are. You know, Marxism gave us that firm ground at one time, other ideologies gave us that ground at one time. Um, but with the absence of that ground, it seems that it's in a way difficult to make an artistic gesture because you never know what definitions people might carry in their heads when they look at your artwork, when they look at the production that you actually present. So therefore there's so, so, so much lack of clarity that we need to talk about the definitions of where we are and what the problems are at least what the nature of the problem is, even if we can identify in the real existing conditions what that problem is. Um, and and that might be a reason for why discourse becomes an important part of the artistic activity. Um, I suppose I would like to ask Galit and, and Tona, but also Erden, why, why do you think that your organizing projects, which have as much as an exhibition model, models of discussion and models of meeting with them? Tona, maybe you could start. Well, I think the two have to be there together at all times because I think discourse always carries the the, the problem of closure and definite uh, definitions or meanings. Uh, so in interrelation with the visual, uh, you can constantly unpack um, closed meanings and definitions and, and move on to new territories. Uh, but I think you're absolutely right, Charles, in saying that, that the, the, the ver verbal naming of things, of unnameable things, like how do you address a repressed past? How do you address the aspect of Israel existing on foreign territory or forcing Denmark to acknowledge its colonial past uh, or Sweden or Norway for that matter? It is important to have a verbal encounter of that um, amnesia, I think. Um, uh, I will be more practical, I think. Um, I, I see it in, in a way a bit... Can you speak it's in not the, the mic? The, um, a bit um, on the opposite. I think um, art, uh, the art scene, the museum, the, the uh, art center give us a possibility to meet. In our situation, when we do an art project, we can cross the law and it will be accepted as part of an art project. Um, and dealing with art, like what's happened like in the end of liminal spaces, part of us know what's happened. I think being part of the art system, and this Maybe is something that- You have to say what happened, right? You can't just leave people hanging. No, or but, but also, you know, um, yeah, we have some problem with, uh, with, um, with the security at the airport because um, International visitor allowed to be in Israel and the territories, you know, like any other, you know, like tourists. But um, we are not allowed. Um, and it was kind of, but it's going to, to go to the detail of uh, airport. Anyway, it was kind of a problem that people were there and they uh, felt, I think, the one that's uh, been in the security, but I think Erdogan can describe better his experience at the airport. Uh, and. He, in the end, I think you felt like guilty, no? That you made something really bad. Uh, but this is part of the system. Uh, and to be aware, maybe you have to experience, so I don't say that we planned it in forehand, but um, to be like in the first liminal spaces or to bring during uh, third liminal spaces, the student from the academy, 
Yeah, we have to prepare a permits. Uh, we need to uh, for the students for RIM for the Palestinian artists. So the, there is a lot of operations that going under, you know, on the ground that we are achieving something that without this umbrella of the art project we never could achieve. Like to get for a uh, Khaled a permit for one day that he went to see his wife, and this is something which you don't normally deal in uh, in an art institute like everyday life. But this is part of our our everyday life you know, under this umbrella. So it's not just the discussion on another format. We're using the uh, umbrella of um, the art, you know, whatever one and, and the, the establishment want to see it to operate in other ways. So... You yeah, know, it's I clear, I think. Um, Erden, do you want to say anything about the biennial um, reaction that uh, in a way placed the biennial at, at another, the, the, the last biennial, the, the tenth biennial? Um, that placed it in, an, in another public sphere, in a way created a discussion through its own presence. Yeah. And please As indicate if you want questions, then I can start lining you up. Um, as I concluded, um, that the contemporary arts now is being seen as the, you know, um, the most corrupted, uh, field, I mean, also the biennial became uh, the biggest target um, in this recent months, um, in which um, the uh, dean of a fine art academy um, uh, published a kind of uh, declaration against the catalog tax of Huhanru, in which he criticized uh, the structure of the uh, experience of Turkish modernism in which uh, the Kemalist, the foundationary ideology was imposed from the top to the population. I mean, this is a very common, actually, argument uh, uh, within the old fields of, old field, old fields of uh, social sciences. I mean, a lot of professors have been talking about that. And it's, I mean, it's clear kind of uh, situation, but it, uh, the reaction came like, you know, you are coming from an out, from outside and then you are teaching us, you know, what we are experiencing and then you are denigrating uh, the value, the benefits of the, um, of the Republican Revolution. So that was a kind of reaction and it became a kind of huge issue and a kind of scandal. But, of course, but besides that, there were also uh, different types of reactions um, to the biennial, uh, of course, who Hanru, when he used uh, the expression uh, optimism in the age of global war, he meant uh, that um, you know art can be a kind of vehicle to envisage um, a kind of uh, openings, a kind of social openings, um, which is which doesn't sound very far to the uh, you know post Seattle uh, slogan of another world is possible. But the slogan, the, the word optimism has been um, completely recuperated by the sponsors of the biennial. Um, in which, for example, the uh, Koch family, the biggest, the biggest bourgeois family who decided just recently to support the biennial for 10, for ten years, um, uh, kind of launched a very aggressive, I will say, uh, advertisement uh, campaign. Uh, which is completely unusual for contemporary art. So every night on every TV channel, you know, on the billboards, on the newspapers, and so on, you see this kind of slogan of, or the motto of uh, Huhanru being reduced to uh, this um, small uh, morphing uh, advertisement in which it starts with, art has never been go that good. And then, uh, then a suffix comes up, and then it becomes art has never been done optim optimistic. Which I mean, this is a pan on in Turkish language. I means uh, good, imsar means op optimistic. So, oh, uh, of course, a huge reaction came, uh, resentment. I will even say, and but even I mean, as a person who is critical to the whole mainstreaming and commercialization and recu recuperation, serialization, normalization, and so on of the whole uh, field, but at the same time trying to protect what have been done throughout the 90s as a kind of independent space, as a kind of very valuable 
um, innovative kind of um, uh, platform for social speculation. Uh, so, as a kind of a believer on to the continuity of this field, uh, I feel also re re um, uh, um, and at one point incorporating, yeah, and on the other hand trying to resist to this kind of national cause. Um, I mean, we are getting away from your question, I'm aware, but uh, I mean, there's, I also want to share this kind of recent anecdote. Um, so we asked uh, Maria Guzinec, I told you before, and my uh, colleagues in the panel, uh, Marina Gruzinic, who is a kind of, I would say, a kind of neo-Marxist uh, theoretician uh, who is working on, the, on visual culture and contemporary art, um, wrote a text on, on the biennial as a kind of review for our magazine, Artist. She is actually one of the editors of one of the previous issues. And then we got in, you know, we are really thinking of what, we sh what shall we do, because I mean, it's a complete um, um, s slapping on the whole biennial system as something uh, getting completely uh, co-opted into a kind of a spectacle system. And then it gets really harsh, aggressive uh, about René Bloch, who is the key figure in organizing the biennial and so on and so on. But I mean, we got, I mean, I personally, I translated the text and I, got really freaked out to the um, fact that the tone in the text is nearly, nearly exactly the same uh, with uh, the nationalist critique uh, that have been posed uh, to um, the contemporary field as such. And uh, I mean, this is why I'm, I keep saying that, you know, there is a need for a double uh, kind of resistance, one to uh, what is going on, this kind of commercialization of the whole system, and then the recuperation and sterilization, and uh, on the other hand, uh, resistance to this kind of uh, essentialist ident identity politics. And uh, I mean, as a pr going back to the quest your question, my whole effort has been to kind of establish the link between contemporary art scene, who had this kind of political interest, but lacking um, this performational uh, dimension and also links to uh, the really existing political activities. And on the other hand, uh, the radical politics uh, in Turkey who uh, could not, um, let's say, adopt a kind of uh, new terminology and methodology um, in the post Seattle atmosphere and s stuck to this even sometimes Stalinist kind of uh, descent. I think clearly not only in Turkey, so it's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a global problem. Um, I would like to turn to the audience now. We uh, started around 15 minutes late, so there's a custom here of the Probansa Kvartiece, which is a quarter of an hour late, so we will run a quarter of an hour late to keep up with local traditions. Um, are there any questions from anybody upstairs, downstairs, above, below? No points of clarification, everything completely clear? <laughs> ah, great. Um. Hello, I'd like to pose a question to Khalid Alad. Thank you for your presentation. Um, having heard that um, art is, like you see art as space to, to cross the law, to make spaces to cross the law, um, I would like to, like to come back to your statement about state establishment and art establishment being somehow in a symbiosis. Um, could you maybe uh, layer out this a bit, like maybe who like what are the main positions in in this in this symbiosis or like somehow what actors are playing which role? Um, yeah, I think um, in general, I think Israel Palestine it's kind of laboratory that everything is a bit more extreme extreme of what people are facing in uh, in Europe, for example, and I think. Uh, the future of Europe, it's, it's there. Look at what's happened like with Israel and Palestine. I don't want to, um, I'm, yeah. 
okay. Um, there is, and I, and I think it's, it's a question also, it's, it's related also, it's something that I want to point to uh, Charles, Charles' question about if we want to talk, you know, if we take another model, if we want, want, don't want to enter to the uh, political discourse, the political discourse, and what, you know, the way that we are try to develop our own language or other way how to deal with uh, certain things or with the things which are unspoken. And it's the question, by doing it, if we are not entering to the same um, kind of silent agreement that I tried to describe in the beginning. Now, um, this silent agreement, it's, it's, quite, it's quite clear, like I think with the, just a few photos that I showed, like in, in the end, uh, around the uh, celebration of, you know, 100 years of Israeli art, Israeli exists 16 years, and it's already two years of celebration of 100 years of Israeli art, which is, so the, the art scene provide another narrative to, to the country, you, to the national narrative, to, to um, make it stronger, to make it I know, more plural, um, in a way. Um, the other thing is, and it's also, it's also a question about what I'm doing. You know, I'm, I'm running a public institute, I'm supported by the city, I'm supported a bit by the country, and the place is recognized, it's very radical and um, activist, whatever you, can, you would like to add on it. But on the other hand, I'm sure that I'm playing the role that was draw for me in the beginning. Okay, I'm, I'm, and this is something, and it's also, it's a question directed to, um, for example, Avi Mugrabi, the way that his uh, film, which are uh, criticized, not just the uh, politician or the, the political situation, but also the, the left, how the left react, and, and, and the, uh, the soldiers, and I think all the member, member, member in the Israeli society, uh, how it's manipulated and what kind of, how it's entered to the bigger political discussion. I, I don't have an answer. It's something that I, I think, I don't think that I have an answer, but I think it's very important to be aware, not to be naive if you are protest against your country and you say, okay, I'm using the mechanism, yeah, to work from the inside, still not to be naive about that you're still playing a role for, um, let's say in our case, non-democratical, uh, colonialist, uh, whatever you would like to add, uh, um, um, fascist uh, 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 state. Thanks. Um, yeah, maybe one comment about Israel as the or Israel Palestine as the future. I mean, and I mean, I think there's been a number also of architectural surveys that have looked at the whole idea of the settlements and the gated communities and, uh, that are springing up in America now increasingly in. Um, say a, a neoliberal economy like the like the United Kingdom, um, and other neoliberal co uh, economies also in Istanbul with the with the wealth in Istanbul, um, and you see that these models are actually being reproduced. That basically learning from Israel is a is something which is intimately connected with the neo liberal, we could say neoconservative, they're pretty much the same these days, uh, though, those, uh, those agendas. And you see it from military tactics which were tried out in Israel and, 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 and applied in Iraq through to um, the arch domestic architecture. Um, there is a, um, a very quite old film, a Dial History, um, dealing with the hijacking. Of, and I think it's very, very interesting to look at it today and to, to see what's happened at the airport now and what kind of strategy, security system, et cetera, uh, they are using. And I think one of the first uh, hijacking was when Arafat or the Fatah uh, uh, hijacked uh, Israeli. Uh, yeah. No interviews. Can I ask a question? Please. OK, thanks. Well, I guess I'm interested in, in uh, it's a question to Annie and Charles. Um, whether becoming Dutch as a project and the funding that it has received within Europe is regarded as a, you know, as a mainstream multicultural project, um, how your project as such is, is um, conceived by the establishment and, 
and whether you feel that you've been allotted, you know, a certain percentage or quota for multicultural projects and thereby depriving other struggling institutions uh, to continue along the lines of along the lines of this project. Uh, am I making myself clear? Um, you, mean, you mean that, that because we receive the money then we would deprive other people of this, this kind of quota of money? I mean, I think that's possibly true. I'm not sure. I mean, the Netherlands is an incredibly rich country. I mean, it's one of the things that it has is money. Um, so in a sense, that's not a... Oh, I mean, we have too much money as a museum, I think, in many ways, um, to, be, to be frank. I shouldn't say this, but others. I think it's, you know, relative to situations in the rest of the world, I think it has to be recognized. So, in a sense, I feel that one of the things is how, what, do you do, what do you do with the money? What do you use the money for? And we won a prize, um, which was, uh, had some kind of um, controversial aspects to it because it was about competition, and that goes against the culture of consensus. Um, and... Um, and we had to decide whether we would compete with that prize and if we would want it, w win it, what we would do. Um, so, I, I mean, that money could have gone to another museum, but it was dedicated to other museums for sure. I think in the, in the, larger, uh, 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 scene, uh, the larger perspective, I think that's true that the, the, the Dutch art scene, if we talk about that, is top heavy in the sense that it has many substantial museums with collections but it seems there's a gap between those big museums, um, many of whom, you know, I would argue, don't take advantage of the monies that they have to do things which are more experimental or interesting, but supply a kind of more spectacular culture, um, and the grassroots. And I think that gap is certainly something that, that you know, we would um, l like to see filled, I suppose. Annie, do you want to say something? Yeah, no, I think it's a really, really important question and I think it's something that we've been constantly trying to problematize in a, in a fairly open way. I mean, one of the first things, and it was actually a comment that uh, Sarat Maharaj made when we won the prize, was, you know, the danger of a prize. On one level, it was really interesting because it provoked an argument. It provoked a debate about, you know, what museums should be doing about, uh, you know, the, uh, kind of a highly visible moment where people actually competed, you know, in terms of ideas and, and programming about this idea. And I think I kind of value that opportunity in a way. But the danger, of course, is that one thematizes something like diversity, which is, you know, I mean, and the danger would be that we would make, take the money and, and sort of make a very, what we've been trying to talk about, a, a, an authoritative kind of show or a closed meaning, you know, and, and not use it in, in a situation where we might um, actually, yeah, think through those problematics, um, insist on thinking about the possibility of us changing as a museum as well, so that it's not that we can say we won the prize, we did this project, we tick it off and then we move on to something else. So it's, it's I suppose the danger is, on one level it gives an intense visibility and on another level it, it suggests that one can win a prize or one can deal with this somehow on a thematic level instead of the insisting that everybody should be doing this. And the other point, I think what we've tried to do, conscious of that idea of money, is also work with a lot of different partners. We have a lot of smaller institutions who are, and bigger ones, um, who are part of this project and we've tried to, try to, to, to take in expertise and voices of, of everybody um, in an attempt to kind of both spread the wealth and, and share the expertise. Yeah, I guess my, my question was no, not so much directed at, at how the FANAB has utilized the money, but more that uh, the way neoliberal cultural politics and funding function these days, that we allowed a lot this amount of money for this thematic and this amount of money for this thematic. And does everybody else get off the hook because FANAB is now doing this project? I, that's what I meant, I think. Uh, um, I, maybe, maybe this isn't answering it, but I think it's an interesting example of, of the kind of thing that also that Gallit was talking about that happened here. Um, during the last government where we had in the immigration minister, everybody knows somebody who has a new party which is called Proud to be Dutch, so you can imagine what the kind of rhetoric was. That's enough, I think, to say about her. Um, she was the, the head of uh, integration and immigration. And... Um, we received some money from the Mondrian Stichting to invite a number of non-European Union curators over here to work with us. So that was from an, a branch of government from Ose and Vey, that's uh, um, education, culture and science, I think. No? Um, and um, they, uh, we, um, so we you know, went along to the immigration office and asked for visas for these people. It took us 18 months 
to get the visa from the state. So there you see maybe precisely the kind of the kind of competitions between the states. Yeah, that, that on the one hand there's a state which is giving you money and saying yes, it's very good. You should invite these international groups of people here, these international curators who could therefore have an influence. Some of them are sitting in the audience now. Um, on the other hand, uh, there's a set of rules r run by um, a fairly um, unpleasant uh, uh, minister, um, which resulted in 18 months delay in that whole project. And, and, and it resulted as uh, ironically actually almost losing the money because they said, well, you haven't invited the people yet. Why haven't you spent the money? And we were going, because the other arm of your government won't allow us to do it. So, you know, that, that, that kind of conflict is, 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 is kind of typical of the sort of, I mean, it's a, it's a small example, but it's typical of the way that the state will operate in two ways. Yeah, it will give in terms of the cultural field, and allow a certain toleration that's the same with, with the digital arts. But if you really want a Korean or a Kazakh or a, or, a, or a Turkish person to come here and work, then you hit another set of rules, which are much, much harsher and much, much more applied to the neoliberal agenda. And then it, 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 it's the question, yeah. Um, if, you know, um, one thing that when I, um, I I'm, you know, look at the text of this project, I say, okay, uh, the, part of the discussion will be about multiculturalism. There is a multiculturalism in Holland? There is? Yes? I think there is a plural system. I don't think there is multiculturalism, and I don't know if there's something that, you know, discussed here at all. What is the difference between plural society and multicultural society? You know, when you, you all the voices are, and this is just one thing, when you can hear all the voices, all the voices have the same uh, possibility to be heard, and when, um, you have like, you know, different, yes, different, uh, you have people with a different uh, ethnic background that living together, which is something completely different. And this, if, if not, this project's playing a role of, yes, there is a multicultural in Holland and it's discussed by this project and probably another project. And this is something on in environment that you serve in a way. So I, I don't think one, shouldn't do those, those kind of projects because then you have to measure, you know, when, where, where you lose something, where you gain something, yeah? If, as you say, if the project will continue and have like another, you know, it not will end with an exhibition, okay, we mark it for everybody, we mark it for, you know, the Mondrian Stichting, we mark it for everybody else. Speaking to the microphone. Um, but <laughs> um, another question, Daphne. Can you, sorry, can you speak into the microphone? Because we have a packed hall and nobody can hear upstairs unless we do speak into the microphones. Thanks. Yes, to, to respond to, to Galit, of course there is this, uh, this is responding to, to a competition and a prize, so there is a certain agenda to the prize. But then what would be, you seem to, to say there is another position than to speak from within, so, or what would it be then other possibility to to, to respond? Um, I, I don't, I will not offer a possibility. I don't think I have one. If I have one, I will use it immediately. I think just to be aware, um, to be aware of what, you know, what you gain or what you can create and how other will, will use it. I think this is the most important and, and to be aware all of, you know, all the way. When you, uh, I mean, it's not just about the prize. The prize, I think, was you got a prize because it was a demand to certain kind of discussion around this topic, of so, so where the demand come from, and you know, it's uh, the demand made by whom, and to work with those questions all the time and to be aware. It, there is, I don't think there is a, a good answer. I don't think there, you know, I I can't find to, to a position that I'm playing like in one hand to use the governmental money to protest against the government like very hard like in during Lebanon war we made a um, yeah a petition but yeah but I mean it's interesting maybe the title of the prize was stimulating prize which is which is translated as incentive prize but isn't quite right in some ways because it's also about a sort of investment it's an investment to create the conditions where subsequently Further developments can take place, you know. So it's it's like an in a uh, 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 in a way a capitalist strategy yeah, in which you would create very small companies, and you know a couple of them would survive and become rich, and ten of them would die, and you, but you start those ten to see to stimulate activity and to see which ones work. So in a sense, you could see the prize also as a as as genuinely an attempt to stimulate 
an activity, but also as a kind of investment to then hope to see whether it works or not, to see whether multiculturalism will fly in the Netherlands or not. You know, and maybe it will and maybe it won't, and let's see how it goes. Other questions? It's one at the back there and one at the top. Can I take the one at the back first and then the one at the top? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I have a um, question for Tone Nielsen. Um, I mean, I, I appreciate your project and I know it relatively well from your website. But during your talk, there was moments where I became really worried and um, I found very problematic. Um, for example, when you mentioned that bringing in post-colonial intellectuals um, from former colonized countries, you know, to speak was a moment where you reversed Western cultural hegemony because it was a moment where you would listen to and learn from these people. Um, and those are moments where I feel it's just too easy. Um, that what we're talking about is an irreversible process um, that takes hundreds of years. Um, and that maybe to name the process that easily, you know, in passing, I know it's a very short summary of a very big project, um, but, or for example, to name that you want to have 65% minority people, then I wonder how you, you know, defined minority majority, um, etc. There are just many points, and I know it's difficult in such a short presentation, but it worries me as to the kind of depth and seriousness and the realization of, you know, how much remains uncorrectable, you know, and how large this project is in, in the bigger social and political sense. Sorry, thanks. Okay, I'll try and answer in two parts. Um, so to get first to the, the the notion of bringing of curating across the north south divide and bringing together post colonial practitioners in a colonial setting where um, the majority subjects are then encouraged to listen and learn. Um, I think what happened in in all four acts uh, were highly important for the local populations. Um, one of the dangers of uh, rethinking Nordic colonialism would have been if Frederica and I, as a Danish curator, would have come to Greenland or the Faroe Islands and have told these people in an anthropological way, here we're bringing these people from the outside, let's study and learn again. Let's represent you. What was important about this project was that there were experiences and knowledges that already existing that the project sort of just amplified and, and spread out into the world, primarily to Scandinavia, but also internationally. Um, it was this moment for me where, where knowledges become visible on an equal setting, where um, Shaki Alexander uh, or Mushek Valanga from post-colonial states could contribute to um, a growing and increasing independent movements in Greenland, which is further behind and needed the energy and resources from, from post-colonial uh, societies who've made it on the other side of colonialism, if you know what I mean. Um, both Greenland and the Faroe Islands have uh, independence movement, but the populations are split the independence to Denmark, uh, specifically in terms of money, is so strong that uh, all agree that they want independence, but they disagree as to when this is going to happen. To have a debate about independence as a process, as a mental decolonization process, with post-colonial subjects who are on the other side of independence was important. This is what the project could contribute with, this is what the project facilitated. That's what I mean about curating across the North-South divide. Does that answer your question partly? Um, you could go later in the Yeah. <laughs> your other question was to the 65-35 representation uh, model. Um, it's important to underline that we choose uh, and select practitioners for our project based on the way they engage uh, their identity or their position as a politics and not as an essential um, subject. Saying that it's not enough to be a, a female artist, you have to engage in the politics of femininity in a specific way that relates to the project we're working with in order for us to select you. 
Um, and something does happen when you all of a sudden have a public hearing situation. Again, I'm referring to Nuke because this is what you saw, where you have uh, uh, several queer um, subjects on the same panel who are able to differentiate the notion of, of queerness. Um, again, not forcing one lesbian woman to represent both um, um, femininity um, and uh, sexuality, but having several subjects um, differentiating those different minority positions. I, I hope that's an, that answers your question. Um, up in the gods. I think it's a question uh, maybe a little bit for the entire panel, but I was thinking now that uh, the identity of an artist is so undefined that almost you could say that an, an artist is the person who makes art. I mean, this kind of post-Duchamp uh, thing. So I was wondering, what do you think that, what, what's the specificity that you think that artists can bring for, uh, in this context of discussions, uh, especially maybe in Galitz and Tones, uh, project that there was this kind of uh, this symposium or discussion before the actual exhibition. I don't know if in Galit's uh, project there was an actual exhibition later, but what do you think that they can bring to the discussions specifically and then we'll ask, uh, to the exhibition later? Um, maybe something that I didn't mention. Um, during the uh, conference in Leipzig, we made an, an one exhibition, Liminal Spaces exhibition, and uh, the artist, also the uh, wide audience, uh, look at, let's say, half-baked uh, work, work in process or in progress. Um, and when we, then we, we decided not to have any more uh, liminal spaces ex exhibition, not to have one exhibition. So some of the work, I think it's been very, um, to, today, later on, you will see uh, Yael Batana uh, summer camp uh, work that developed under, or it was in a way the structure or, uh, for the beginning of um, some summer camp. And I think, like Yael met Jeff Halper and was aware to the, um, uh, his uh, um, group activity or, um, and also, you know, other project, which I'm, um, uh, that you could see in, in the documenta was Peter Friedel, the giraffe, that he, the mummy giraffe that he transferred from uh, Palestine. So you can see here and there um, work that developed under, under this uh, umbrella or with this uh, structure. And uh, the idea of, you know, that people meet first, you have the, I think, personal engagement to the place and to the other uh, participate. And this is very important. And then come the knowledge, the extra knowledge, and the experience at the same time. And then I think, you know, one or artist can go and, you know, to the studio, to the, you know, any different kind of practice. So. In terms of uh, the Rethinking Nordic Colonial Project, um, the Nordic Colonialism Project, um, I think it was very important for people to see uh, their local situation or their local condition represented uh, by artists coming from other places as well as from local artists. Um, so again, the the level of, of being able to mirror you in a situation that is similar to yours, not quite the same, but similar to yours. Um, so to uh, have um, a Finnish Sami artist uh, represent her conflict of being half Sami, half Finnish in a modern society and showing that work in, in Greenland for, for Inuit people who share the same conditions uh, was meaningful. And then as I said before to Charles, I think that again visual art um, can expand discourse, it doesn't provide closure, it just takes you further and further into uh, unknown territory and it's very difficult to nail down the visual and close it. Okay, I'm getting lots of signs that we have to stop because there's lunch time. The Prabhansa Kvot teacher has gone on for five and twenty minutes now, so I think it's definitely time to stop. I'd like to thank our speakers enormously and please give them a round of applause.
and add that we will be also in the lunchroom, so if you have any further questions, please um, feel free to come up to us and ask them individually. Thanks very much, and see you back here about quarter past two, I would imagine, for Homi Baba. Thank you.